I thought, uh, thanks for having me. This is a really fun crowd. I've heard a lot about how engaged everybody is. And uh, given the, the technical depth and, and um, experience, you usually get really good questions. So I thought it might be better uh, for me not to just blab away for 45 minutes on slides. And instead, you just interrupt me whenever you want. And we'll turn it into more of a conversation. Um, because I. Uh, tend toward laziness, what I did is uh, not make new slides for you all, except for changing the cover of a keynote I just gave and putting Hannah House at the bottom. So what I'm, what I'm going to do is just jump between slides that, that I give otherwise. So don't expect this to look pretty as I jump around and show you different things. Um, so with that, uh, how about we get started? That, this, by the way, is a, uh, the skull of a macaque um, with a little uh, neural dust moat held uh, uh, by a little wire, and it is relevant to um, something later in the talk that I'll show you. The, the point of this talk and why that picture is there, the keynote that I gave, is that where we're doing a lot of work now academically is showing how you can use all this while uh, going through the skull itself. And I'll talk about that at the end, because I want to start with a bit of a tutorial. So that's what that is. It's a macaque skull. OK. Um, whoa. Am I super loud? I'm good? OK. Um, I have a really loud voice. That's probably the problem. I'm good? OK. Uh, so two things to kick us off. One is uh, I'm, I'm a very good bullshitter. And so uh, I can tell you pretty much anything. And I bet that some of you would catch a few lies. And some of you wouldn't. So what I do to hedge, to not hedge, to account for that is I'm going to put up what the papers that you can actually go look up later. Uh, and you know, if you're really interested in this, kind of fact check me and say, well, I, I heard something. What was it? And I also like to give credit to all the people that this is really driving me crazy. Yeah, exactly. No, it's just kind of killing me with the echo. I think it's off. Okay. Do you want to just put it here? No, because I need I need to post it. Okay. I, I think it's too loud. Thank you. Okay, still too loud. Still too loud. Okay, there we go. Okay, okay, there we go. Oh yeah, that's true. I have to talk. I apologize. All right, there. That's awesome. So, uh, I also want to credit all the people that uh, do all the work that let me come up and you know do these fun things with all of you. So first off, uh, I'm a gadget builder. That's what I do. And I've had the privilege to work with Jose Carmena, which is a, a brilliant pioneer in uh, uh, brain machine interfaces. Um, and a lot of this work is really just a, a long, long term partnership. It started at Disneyland uh, nine years ago when we were having a beer, and he said, Why don't you stop screwing around with bugs and do something worthwhile? And so I took his advice. Um, the, I'm not going to be, be tedious about this. I'm going to walk you through a bunch of different things. I just wanted to highlight. Uh, the, the brilliant people that do this, so, uh, and then leave it there. DJ was, the, well, along with Ryan, the first author in really a lot of the early neural dust work. DJ is off at Neuralink now. He helped start it. Uh, and Ryan is off at the company commercializing neural dust. Likewise, um, some of the newer work has been done uh, with Ricky Muller, who's a brilliant chip designer, and a lot of her people and, and people in my group. That's a mix of, of Smiley. Uh, they never smile this much because they're usually chained into the lab, and we give them hamster, little hamster food and water droplets to keep going. Um, this kid is brilliant. Uh, he's, gonna, he's behind a lot of the skull stuff I'm going to talk about, David. Uh, and at the end, I'll show you an incredibly crazy idea. If you don't think neural dust is crazy enough, I'll show you another crazy idea uh, that was uh, uh, developed by Mason in my lab, who's now a professor at CMU, uh, which I find every time I explain it to people, people are like, Really? That, that's real? So I'll, I'll show you that at the end. So we're going to jump around a lot. But first, I have to uh, even the playing field uh, by giving you a, a quick uh, tutorial. Because if I don't do this, then uh, a lot of it will be lost. And here's an opportunity to test out whether anybody wants to ask me questions. OK? So I'm going to do this fast. Uh, but hopefully, you just stop me if I'm going too fast. All right. So the first thing I do is I, uh, without uh, attribution, steal a picture from Google. Uh, of a brain. I have no idea who made this, and I apologize, but that's just a reasonable brain. And uh, what we're interested in for the purposes of this conversation, and I, another thing I want to say is I'm going to try really hard to be very sober uh, about what this really does, because I think this excites a lot of people's imagination. 
And so then what happens is you get people writing all sorts of nuttiness. So I'm going to be very, very sober. And the first part of that is to explain to you what problems we were going after when we developed this technology and what we weren't. So um, th that wrinkly part, as you all know, is your cortex. And an entire field has arisen over the last 15 years um, that has shown that if you can capture the signals in the cortex, the, the spikes, if you will, which I'll explain what, what I mean by that, the, the signaling, you can in fact do an amazing things with that. You can drive robot arms, you can uh, teach the brain itself to rewire around the implanted part to learn what the implanted part wants to do, and on and on. The, 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 the field is, is really as remarkable as it seems when you read science news. It's a privilege to be in, in this field right now. Um, and so what we set about when addressing the thing I'm going to specifically talk about today, my group does a lot of other things in this space, is is there a way that we can make technology that does that but will potentially last a long time in the body? That's the problem we're going to go after. And I'm, I'm, going, to, I'm going to kind of hit that multiple times. OK, so here, here is a little drawing of a neuron. And what I want to explain for the purposes of this talk is that when a neuron does its thing, um, what you get is a change in chemical potential between the outside and the inside of the neuron uh, that is used by the neuron to propagate a signal down its body. So, so we don't have to get into a lot of the details unless you, unless you want to. But essentially, as a neuron tries to send a signal down to its buddies, uh, the way that that signal propagates is reflected as a change in chemical potential between the inside and the outside. If uh, you like Faraday, and this of course was observed a bazillion years ago and, and two wonderful very, very big prizes were awarded long ago, um, you observe that that chemical potential can be read out as an electric potential. Okay, And so if one were to do that, one would see tens of millivolts of difference as this signal like shoots by you. If you're looking at a particular part of the neuron and the signal comes by, between the inside and the outside, there's in the tens of millivolts. You can kind of see that y-axis. Th that's the, the voltage difference if you try to electrically sample the potential difference. So now comes this very simple question of how would I do that? And again, this is very old stuff, but, but it, you have to understand it in order to understand some of the other stuff I'm going to talk about. So what do you do? Well, I'm going to try to shove a little piece of metal into the inside of the cell, and I'm going to put another piece of metal outside of the cell, and I'm going to measure a voltage, and that'll give me that thing I just showed. And that's called intracellular recording. Um, it is very, very hard to do. Um, you usually come in with a little glass capillary or something fancier and, and tuck, touch it right up to the cell membrane and then pop a little hole and have a little electrode in the capillary and have another electrode outside. And, a skilled technician uh, can do remarkable things, and, and scientists have been doing this for 50 years. Um, but that's very hard to translate into any clinical anything. It's very, very hard to do that. So what historically has happened is something different. What you do is you say, what happens if I put both of the wires outside? OK, so you put them outside. And what you find is, of course, now you don't see that very large change in electrical potential smaller. It's like the whisper. As the cell is doing its thing, little ions are moving around outside the cell trying to adjust as that signal comes through. And if you have two pieces of metal outside, you'll see a little blip that tracks with the one I showed you, but really tiny. So like microvolts. Little microvolts just barely happening. Okay. So this is called extracellular recording, and it is the foundation of any electrophysiological recording that's done in any medical device and in much of the research that's done, OK? Now, as you all know, the last 10, 15 years have, have had incredible uh, advances with regards to how you can use light to record things and also to stimulate them. But for the purposes of this conversation, we're, we're going to really, like I said, focus very, very heavily on um, what is used for clinical purposes right now. And, and so this is how you would record. What are the problems? Well, if you're an electrical engineer, I believe many of you are, you immediately say, well, that's kind of you know, stupid because in the limit as this electrode is next to this one, there is no potential difference if they're in the same place. So why don't you put one of these really far away to kind of maximize the difference? And that, in fact, is what you do. 
the first thing you do, and this will become relevant later, I'm not just kind of lecturing because it's my vocation. Um, what you do is you, you take one of those two electrodes and actually you bolt it to the skull or you put it somewhere far away uh, that is, and it's a, usually a big giant electrode. And it's the other one that you make really tiny and you try to get it as close as you can to whatever neuron you want to hear, right? Okay, so that's kind of how it's done. This will become relevant. Now the problem is, um, now you're not, nothing of this setup is now inside the cell. So you don't have that sort of pleasure of just recording what's happening at one cell. You're stuck in this cocktail party of cells and they're all firing away, doing whatever the heck they're doing. And so when you're taking a recording, it's gonna be a big mess. It's gonna be whatever you're closest to, plus the three other ones that are nearby, they're gonna add, if they're chattering away, you're gonna have low level stuff. And so you actually get a very complicated mess, which interestingly enough, this is an aside I won't get into. Originally, historically, what people would do would filter out everything but the spikes, because their logic was everything else is this garbage of, of noise. And in fact, it turns out all that stuff isn't garbage, it's super useful, and you can, you know, you can drive whole medical devices on just the, what is the cocktail party chatter, right? Like we're all sitting here just on the murmur you can pick it up and you can tell if the crowd is happy or the crowd is really upset or that part of the crowd is doing something. But any, in any event, for our purposes, this signal, uh, electrical signal can be really complicated. And that matters. Okay, so, and then lastly, um, the, your, in the cortex, your neurons are arranged. This is an exaggeration because this is a particularly pretty part of a rat's cortex, but it shows the point. Your cortex is, is, has structure to it. It's not just a giant mass of spaghetti that's all wired into itself willy-nilly. There are columns of integrated neuronal processes, each of which you know, kind of integrates many, many thousands of inputs and then does all sorts of things to go back out. And that organization, even the fact that as they come in, they're sort of aligned in a particular way, that has consequences for the electrical signal that I'll show you in a minute. I, 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 I always like to give this tutorial because it helps put into context when you read science news and then you see it in neural interfaces. You can now understand where all the different pieces. So with that tutorial, I'm gonna walk you through what you do today. And this is a, a um, oh, this should have attribution, and I apologize, it somehow got erased. It's from a paper by Schwartz in 2006. Uh, this shows you, I'm gonna use this to walk you through everything you've ever seen in the news that's electrical with regards to recording brains, um, and map it then back to neural dust. So, you've all seen some EEG, right? Every EEG, ooh, EEG. Uh, EEG is putting electrodes outside. The way you should think about that for the purposes of today's conversation is, let's say everyone's, uh, you know, Cal and Stanford are, are having a football game uh, and uh, I'm really far away from the stadium. There's no way I can pick up anything from a conversation between two people in the, in the bleachers, but I can certainly tell when the stadium is singing uh, one of the football songs, right? I can just hear that in the distance. That's what EEG is doing. It's picking up any coherent activity into humongous amounts of cells that it can be picked up at a distance electrically when you put electrodes. And that's why it's very good for telling sleep, right? Sleep states. Uh, it's very, very good. Interestingly enough, it can, you can use it to detect when you've made a mistake. Uh, it turns out your, a lot of your brain freaks out very, very briefly when, you've, when you're about to consciously realize that you, you, have to, you made a mistake writing something and you're going to go back and erase. Uh, so there's all sorts of things like that, but it's very high level. The, the next level down to try to capture some of these signals I'm talking about is called ECOG, electrocorticography, and this is used in open brain surgery. Um, and a lot of work is going on right now around this at Stanford and at UCSF and at Berkeley where what, so what, what happens there is you, you open the skull and you set it on the table and then uh, over the, the cortex you lay a sheet of usually silicone, but it doesn't matter, sort of a polymer sheet that has lots of little electrodes. And they're sitting in contact, but you're not piercing into anything and you're not outside the skull. It's just sitting over the cortex. And what, you're gonna, what you find is now you're not really far from the stadium. You're sort of watching and then you see like this that part of the cortex, that whole bleacher section is doing something, and then you see that whole bleacher section is doing something. That's the kind of the, the, the analogy. And it, this is extremely useful. So for example, it's being used now very regularly um, to decode human speech. You can put this on you know, the top of a cortex and close the skull, and you can, or right over the part of the cortex that's responsible for either the hearing speech or producing it, and you can, you can ba basically back out. Uh, what's going on because that level of resolution is good enough to, to tell. 
And I'm happy to point you to that work if, if anybody cares after the talk. Um, so ECOG is now, we're getting closer. Then um, we might say that's not good enough. I, I want to see that each neuron. I want to see every, what every neuron is doing because it's important. Well, then you've got to get into the cortex. And the way you do that is you put these electrodes on little needles or wires and you go and you just you go for it and you and you put it in I'll show you pictures of that and that will capture the signal unit action potential I've been showing you and also the cocktail party which is which is called the field potential but that's a direct that's as close as you know you're going to get extracellularly to really what every little neuron is doing in the area so far so good I haven't lost anybody no one's too bored okay so um, what, what do you care? I'm not going to go through this list. I, I just put it here as, a, as an, I, kind of an eye chart. But what do you care when you're building this if you care about some of these clinical translational problems? Like I'd really like to be able to build these interfaces in a way that can eventually go into humans and do something useful. Now, I'll get to that. I'll, I'll validate where I think that, that makes sense. Well, the thing I want to leave you with today is that you've got to make something that lasts a long time in the body. And that's a complicated problem. And, and why is it complicated? Well, number one, when I stick this in here, I, I don't want to damage. I want to damage as little as possible, right? Because there's stuff in the way. The more uh, innervated your uh, brain tissue is, the more vascularized it is. So there are just as many little capillaries as there are you know, neurons in that place. And it's amazing. People don't think about that. If you look, go, go Google the capillary bed of your cortex, and it's amazing. Um, why? Because it requires all that oxygen and all these nutrients. When you stick these things in there, you're going pop, 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 and just popping capillaries all the way down if you're doing it in the cortex. So you have to be careful. And so now you've got this thing in there. The body will respond to it. You're, it'll, it'll try to encapsulate it in, in glia cells. It, there's all sorts of, of things. On the other hand, now that's you messing with the tissue. The tissue is going to mess with, with your system because it, immediately you're going to get, those of you that... Um, you know, worked in hardware. Who, who has worked with electronics? Like who's a chip or, or, or board? I'm kind of curious how much this, this will make sense. So if I told any of you, I'd like you to, uh, you know, make this ASIC and like throw it in the ocean and have it run for 20 years, it's an absurdity, right? But that's what this is. I mean, you're making a, a solid state object and shoving it into an aggressive environment, a saltwater aggressive environment, and you want it to last in there, you're going to get insulators delaminated. You get a lot of failure of the, just the stuff. And so, and lastly, the things themselves, if they're very large relative to the cells around them and they're very stiff, the cells know that. And so they, they start noticing, like, why is the Empire State Building here all of a sudden? And why is it going up and down constantly as this person jogs, right? Like, what's going on? And they respond to all of these cues. And so this idea that, you know, these things are too large and they're connected by wires has really big, become a problem. Okay, so I'll show you pictures to prepare you for dinner. So this is... Uh, that's ECOG uh, in a human and in a macaque. Uh, some of these things are from my lab. They're, actually, this is a really old picture that's long ago was published, not unpublished. But you can see these are these little dots. You put them over. That's an ECOG. Just to kind of show you what it looks like. This is a sampling of a variety of uh, arrays that have electrodes that get pushed into the cortex to do these recordings. So that kind of gives you a sense. Um, you can see, right, like it's almost like made to elicit, anybody that doesn't work in this field kind of goes, yeah, why? Right? So th this goes in there. I will, as an aside, point out, and this will become very relevant later in the talk, uh, very similar techniques can be used for peripheral uh, interventions. Right? We all have, there's tons of nerves outside your brain, and they're just as interesting. Uh, and I'll come back to that. And so you have all sorts of the same problems. Your, all the nerves that run through, for example, if you take the vagus nerve, which is this enormous nerve that runs on either side of your neck and couples to almost all of your organs, your torso organs, um, that thing has something like 70,000 different processes sending signals. It's like a big, big cable. And it's wrapped in, in a membrane just like your brain is uh, called the epineurium. And so you have all the same problems. Like, do I pop that membrane? Do I use one of these things? Do I wrap around? And what, you know, it's, it's a very similar situation. Um, I'll skip all this. I think this is good enough for now. But what I did want to show you is that when we started the neural dust adventure, the state of the art uh, was really, you know, taking this, right? and, and uh, getting it approved for medical use. This is pioneering work. Um, a, a lot of this uh, really uh, related to work that goes on at Stanford. All, just amazing work uh, that's been going on for a long time. But anyway, you take these things and open a hole in the skull and push it in and then bolt this amplifier box to the skull and 
have that wire come out and then use the recordings that come out of that to do some really, really amazing things for people with very severe motor dysfunction. <clears throat> and these were groundbreaking studies. They're generally called brain gate, if you want to look like a Google term to look up. Um, but that was the state of the art. OK, so that's my intro before I talk to you about neural dust. A any, any takers on a question or we're good? Keep going? All right, I'm going to keep powering through. All right, so now let's take a step back. So now you kind of appreciate a little bit of the world that, that this comes from. Now I say, hey, uh, I don't want to do, I don't want to, these things are horrible. They're big, they're wired, they're bulky. I would love to build a super tiny implant that's 100 microns in size. And I just want to record on it because I have the greatest chip designer on earth. They can do all these amplifiers in 100 microns. And I want to put it wherever the heck I want to put it in the body. And I want to get all this data out. And it's going to float in there. It's not going to have any wires. It's going to be amazing. So you know that thought circulated through a lot of brains um, uh, and has for a long time. And so then you go and you say, well, how do we do it? OK, well, let's put an inductive coil on this thing and, and build a little inductor. Or have an antenna and build a radio, right? All of this sort of traditional, let's put a little radio on it, and RFID or something like that. And what you find is that uh, that doesn't work too well if you really want super tiny things. And, and it's actually really obvious why it doesn't work well once you explain it. Um, the reason, and I'll show you all this now, because so a few slides with, with, with plots and stuff and kind of the basic idea. There's two reasons that doesn't work. So, so to slow down, what I'm thinking about is, can I take a little chip with little electrodes that can take that electrical signal, record it, and I want to send it out of the body or out of your brain. I want to put that in there. And I want to make it really tiny. right? If I make a centimeter sized thing, that doesn't super help. right? That would kind of hurt, kind of destroy a lot of tissue. I want something really small. Um, and how do I get the data out? I don't want wires. So let's say I decide I'm going to put a little antenna on it and somehow do some radio wave thing. Okay. The problem is simple to explain. Okay, we're all big bags of salt water. That's the first problem. What does that mean? That means electromagnetic waves, although there are a few places that are a little more forgiving, and people have made brilliant use of those windows, uh, in general, electromagnetic waves just don't do well when going through Water, certainly not salt water. This is why submarines don't have very good radios, and this is why your cell phone doesn't work in a pool, even if you had it in a Ziploc bag. It's not going to work. Um, what happens as, the, as that goes through is all of the water molecules and the ions in there jiggle, and a lot of that energy is lost in the heat, and so it's very hard to penetrate through liquid with just trying to get a radio to work. The other problem, which is a little more subtle, is that light is very fast, as we all know. So if something is very fast through a medium, the, the wavelength of you know, one period right, of this thing actually stretches out a pretty far distance, right? because it's so fast as it goes through one oscillation, one wavelength, it's really far. And so the faster something is, counterintuitively, the bigger these wavelengths are. So the problem then is when you're trying to build something that captures energy, you usually are constrained in some way by the wavelength. Right? So you end up having to build for electromagnetics you know, relatively large things to, to catch that energy. So what does that mean in English? It means two things. If you're going to build little radios, however magical way you're going to do them, you're usually either putting things just under the skin because you're not going very deep, uh, or you're building them fairly large like a postage stamp or larger. And that's not the problem we, were, we set out to, to solve. I want to point out, though, that this is not poo-pooing any of that work. And, and that's not out of academic uh, 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 pr protecting my academic you know, friends from attacking me. It's, it's actually, th that work is all advances in trying to do stuff with radios. It's just the case that if I ask the question, I want to make it really small. I want to make this thing like 100 microns someday. Will I ever be able to do it with a radio? And it's just tough. That's the answer. However smart you are, it's tough. But there's a, there's a, 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 a solution. So the solution is. Um, let me skip through all of this stuff and, and, and just show you the solution. And I'm happy to come back to some of these numbers if you want. But the solution is you don't do any of this with radios. You do it with ultrasound. And as simple as that sounds, that turns out to be a, a big deal. So what do you do? What you do is you say, forget about the radio. I'm going to send ultrasound from right outside the skin, medical ultrasound. I'm going to send ultrasound into the body. So now you have a pressure wave. And that pressure wave is going to hit my implant. 
Okay, so it's going to wash. It's just, it's just like my sound wave. It's going to hit the implant. Now, what happens? Well, in my implant, I'm going to put a crystal uh, called a, a particular type of crystal called a piezo crystal. And when the sound hits the crystal, that crystal will compress and expand with the sound by nanometers. I mean, very small amounts, but it's going to do that. And the beauty of a piezo crystal is that it turns mechanical work into electrical work. So the piezo crystal, if I put electrodes on it, will now produce a current and a voltage at those electrodes as I, you know, torture it. What happens? Well, what I can do now is connect the little chip I was talking about to that, and now I have power. And I'm powering the chip. But then there's one extra step that makes it more entertaining. If my chip can change what it looks like electrically, what, it, what the term, the technical term is an electrical impedance, if it can change how much, how hard it is for the crystal to interact with it electrically, the fact that the crystal is actually changing, uh, it's seeing a changing impedance means it actually reflects acoustic power off of it differentially, differently as that changes. So what happens is the amount of energy, the ultrasound waves that bounce back from the crystal, right? If I hit, if I hit this, this, key, this screen as I'm talking to it is actually reflecting back sound, right? The same thing happens here. Now the, the key is that the crystal, as it changes, you can encode digital information into that reflected signal back. So now what I can do is I can send it power, I can send bits with that power, and I can have that thing talk back to me. There's no batteries. There's no anything. It's all done entirely passively acoustically. And sound is very slow. It's not light. And our bodies don't care. I mean, they, you're pretty much transparent to sound, which means that when you do the efficiency numbers, this is really, really efficient way to do this. And as you shrink it, it works really well. You can build ridiculously small implants that are just sitting there talking back to you on, on these, on these uh, reflected uh, uh, sound bits, if you will. Does that make sense? So that's the whole idea, actually. Like, if there's only, if a slide you have to remember, you just have to remember this slide. Everything else is a bells and whistles on this slide. Yeah? Okay. Yeah? How do you get the implant that small to hold still? Ah, that's a great question. So we've jumped right to the advanced section. How do you get an, I'll repeat it, how do you get an implant to hold still? Because presumably, if the implant is moving around, you're getting all sorts of craziness coming back. Okay, so the answer there is two things. One is, First of all, my external ultrasound system doesn't have to be a very simple, focused, you know, really dumb system. In fact, and we do, this is the entire thing, I'll show you some really crazy results. You just build a multi-element ultrasound phased array head, and what I do is, and I know I'm jumping to a bunch of mumbo jumbo, but I know some of you get it, and some of you are like, what is he talking about? So, uh, if I have many, ex uh, many uh, ultrasound emitting elements in an array on the outside, and I time the phase that goes into each of them, I can do something that's been done forever in radar, which is I can change where the focus point of that ultrasound is electronically. I can sweep it. Right? This is why in 1950s Godzilla movies, the radar thing moves around, and why that doesn't exist anymore. Nobody needs to spin radar antennas madly when Godzilla comes. You just sort of use a phased array radar, and it can target that's why your cars have that, and so on. Same thing with ultrasound. Your external head, is a sophisticated phase array system. So that's number one. In other words, I can track the motion. Okay. The other issue, I'll, go to three, I'll do three. The second issue is that, in fact, if you ex make the focus spot a little bit bigger and you can allow for the focus spot to wash the area, you know, the, the whole motion it's going to have, that actually works really, really well. And why? Because most of the motion that you would experience in the body is very small. It's very small and very slow relative to these frequencies. Um, and lastly, if you digitally encode everything, there are very, very robust methods of even if the reflection come back, comes back all garbled to decode and do error correction and all sorts of sort of digital tricks. So that's kind of the, the menu of things you use to fight it. Yeah, great question. So how do you talk to a lot of them? Are you asking if we had multiple, how would you talk to them? So that, the answer there is that it, it, uh, absolutely you can talk to many of them and I'll tell you how, but Exactly how you would choose to do this depends on how far away they are from each other. So let me give you two examples. One is, let's say I, I have a couple of implants or many implants all sitting near each other such that I can just take my system and talk to this one and then steer the beam and talk and I raster. I could do that. Another thing I can do, which I'm going to show you, this is actually your, you're perfectly preloading a whole part of my talk. I can just wash all of them with ultrasound, with one plane wave ultrasound, have many, many receivers, and as the, re the reflections come back, 
I can use machine learning to figure out who's changing where and build a library and listen to all of them all at the same time. And I'll show you that. So we're kind of, I'm jumping ahead. Yeah. So what's the chip actually measuring? Really? Ah, another great question. So you can, you can do pretty much whatever you like, but let me give you a better answer than that. In the results I'll show you, the early results, what we were specifically measuring was that extracellular potential I talked about. In other words, the, the device is going to be connected to two electrodes and they are going to be listening for that neural spike. Um, having said that, you don't need to be restricted to that, and we knew that from the beginning. So the second thing you could do right away is put this on its head and send power down to be used to stimulate a nerve. And there, there's some trickery there. You have to basically have a little capacitor that stores stuff, and, but you can, you know, I'll show you, that's also in the, in the deck. So now I can stimulate nerves electrically. And lastly, I don't have to do either of those. I could put whatever sensor I want and then use it as a diagnostic, so to, to take data from your liver if I wanted to. And we've built those, so th some of that is about to come out uh, published, so I'm not going to talk about it too much, but you can build all sorts of little sensors that just sit on there and, and just send you whatever data that sensor was measuring. The beauty of this is that it, the, the abstraction is piezo crystal, one or more piezo crystals, a chip that does something, and a sensor that talks to the chip, and you basically just put that together and, and, and do what you want within, you know, within what physics lets you do. But. I think there were more questions. How, how actually, uh, how well do they know that uh, ultrasound is perfectly safe and does not disrupt uh, intracellular processes? That's a great question. Okay, so uh, the, the first part of, let me first start by answering on our work and then giving you the broader answer. The first part is that um, we are extremely, for this, uh, let me book up this, we are lucky in that the ultrasound levels you need to do this, I'll show you the numbers are way below the levels you use for sort of diagnostic ultrasound in many cases. In some cases, they're not way below, they're just below, right? But they're lo below the imaging uh, power levels set by the FDA, and happily so, I mean, reasonably so. A, there are two, however, that's not a good complete answer. You asked a broader question, so let me, let me give you the answer as, as I understand it, or as I, I believe it, or whatever. Um, one, there is an area of work where you purposefully try to stimulate neural tissue with focused ultrasound. This is a very old area that kind of hit a little renaissance about five years ago. There, what you're trying to do is deliver enough power at, at a particular range of frequencies where the neurons somehow respond and fire. I don't, I'm not going to get into the, it's a pretty controversial field. It's like, what, what are you actually doing to those neurons? Does it matter? Is it good? Is it bad? That's, you know, not my area, so I, I follow it, but I don't want to opine. But we're nowhere near those frequencies or powers. I mean, this whole thing is completely distinct. A different question, which is very valid and has been discussed on and off, is all, it's also not really relevant to us, but it has come up, which is even at low levels, I wouldn't say low levels, at medium levels, um, would there be disruption to development, for example, if you were washing, you know, something developing and constantly in ultrasound? And th that's another area where people have an ongoing conversation. In all cases, for us, though, we, we avoid all of those areas, to be, to be honest. So for us, it's not very relevant. The frequencies are very, very different. I can, you know, kind of walk you through, if you want, later, the, those numbers. Um, so for us, not relevant. There are bigger con controversies in the field, but they, they don't involve us, basically. There was another question right here. Uh, so, like, what's the, I guess to build off that question, what's the uh, maximum power you can deliver to one of these devices? So, so, you want to run an accelerometer at the same time you're stimulating? Like, what's kind of per, like, unit area the size of them that you can deliver? Yeah, so I'll show you, let me show you some, um, some examples. Um, so, I'll show you calculated power if you want, but then, I'll, do I have the calculated power here? Just it's me measured, hang on. Uh, I, I don't have the calculated one. The answer, by the way, let me give you a simple answer and I'll show you this. Um, a 750 micron, so three quarters of a millimeter cubic crystal, uh, you know, you can pretty much trivially get, you know, up to maybe a milliwatt and easily half a milliwatt. It's an enormous amount of power for anything you'd want to do. That's the short answer. Then when you get really tiny, it gets a little bit more interesting, and I can show you some of those plots. When you try to get really tiny, it, it, there's an interesting trade-off curve if you like that kind of thing. I can show you where it breaks. If you could just wait and use the microphone. Then everyone. Sure, be glad to wait. Um, for the power that you need, I assume you don't need very much based on what you just said. So how big does a device that I have to carry around with me, if you use this to stimulate neurons to make a limb move, for instance, yeah. what kind of 
What kind of package do I have to have right now? What kind of external device? Yes. The external device actually is, is very small. So the, the uh, now let me, let me back up because in English, let me be careful. Uh, the, ex the external device, you can make it very small. We've not particularly tried academically. And at the very end, I was going to mention this is now a startup that's very funded and da da da. So let me, let me tell you the, the, the answer that will be true in a year from now. Um, the ultrasound head part today, if you just buy off the shelf ultrasound heads like go to imaging, is like you know, about a centimeter tall by some aperture width, a few centimeters. And that can sit in a little wearable plastic housing and then the entire, and with a, with a, you know, a little circuit board. But the entire size of that is really dominated by the battery. So the answer to your question ends up being how long would you like that to operate? Um, and so that's just a battery question and you can look at the power numbers and back that out. And it turns to be, you know, it's an object, you know, it's this big. Um, What's happening, though, is that the, um, the field of ultrasound imaging, particularly portable ultrasound imaging, is moving very, very fast. So companies like Butterfly and Echo and others are building, are leveraging the, the idea that you don't have to build ultrasound heads like you used to, which is bulk piezo materials. You can build these chips, essentially, chip sets that do ultrasound imaging. And now you enter this world where you know, your phone can do ultrasound imaging, right? which is where we're going, by the way, completely independent of us. That's, that's about to come out. So you're, if you Google it, you'll see where, it's, where it is right now. And that's, that's about to break open very soon. And so um, we would leverage all of that technology. right? You just, you just take it, and now it's much, much, much smaller. But in the end, the answer is the battery. To be honest, it's not any of that other stuff. It's the battery. Hi. What goes into the selection of the frequency or frequency ranges that you'd like to use? Oh, that's a great question. So, um, so the, 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 the very first answer is uh, how deep do you want to go? So ultrasound will attenuate, right? It'll, you'll lose energy at about um, half, a, half to one decibel per centimeter per megahertz of frequency. And so if you want to go very deep, the difference between a 1 megahertz signal and a 10 megahertz signal is pretty severe, right? It's not linear. Uh, the second point is it depends on how small you want to make your thing. Because at least in the most naive implementation, you have to cut your crystal so that it is half a wavelength in thickness so that you get a resonant mode in the crystal, so then lambda over 2. So whatever the wavelength is for that frequency, if, if you don't like it because it's too big, you better pick a bigger frequency. And then, and then the operating frequency in which this works is actually pretty broad. I mean, you, know, you, can do, you can do reasonably efficient ultrasound heads all the way up in the tens of megahertz, pretty high tens of megahertz. And so you have quite a range. All right. Oh, one more. I don't know how deep we are into the talks of... So oh, we still have time. We have time. Great, because I want to show you other stuff. There's, this is like the beginning. This is the first few slides. I'm sorry. Is this a slight... Uh, want to slide back? No, no. Oh. I, I want to ask you, are you aware of some of the uh, projects in the Bay Area that involve non-invasive imaging? Yes, I'm well aware of them. Open water? Or yeah, 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 I know all, yeah, yeah, yeah. And are you skeptical? Oh, God. Don't ask me questions like that. <laughs> then I get throw my, I'm not going to throw my friends under the bus. <laughs> I know all those people. No, I, I, th I think the answer, and I don't mean this cheekily, I'm going to give you the, the honest answer is it depends what you want to do with it. If, if, is, is there a world where a non-invasive uh, technique allows you just enough resolution spatially or temporally to get an actual bit out of it? So like, you know, I concentrate and like I flip one bit on my phone? Probably, you know. Is it going to let me run, you know, 2,000 channels of, of of information in it, no. no it, 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 all has, it all has a point. It, it, it just, you have to understand what it's meant for. All of these things, when you dehype them from the you know, media nonsense, everything is going very sanguinely after some slice of this pie, right? Everything has an, it's all engineering. So, so it's gonna work well for this thing. It's not gonna work well for that thing. This is the same, right? It has a world in which this is amazing. Uh, and then there's a world where you try to use this for something and you go, oh, that's not as interesting, right? Stuff like that. So, no, absolutely. I, I, I'm a big fan of all of those efforts. Cool? All right. So, uh, I want to I skip through some of this stuff because I, how, long do I, how long have I been yapping? I've been talking 30 minutes? Uh, yeah. Okay, so, so then I will uh, spend 15 minutes maybe talking more. And so, what I'm going to do is jump to highlights. So, I'm not going to go deep into anything unless at the end of you come back and then I'll go as deep as you want. So I just wanted to show you, I mean, this is what, what we did was we realized that rather than go after the brain, because that's really hard, because there's a big bone that we'd have to make a hole in, um, what we wanted to do is show this in the periphery. 
because it was very easy. It was just amazing like how disruptive we could be. So what we built is we built these things. Here's the crystal, the chip is there, and uh, electrodes are in the bottom. And we did something super cheeky actually that annoyed a few of uh, our colleagues. Instead of building a whole ASIC with like super clever blah, 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 which we've since done and I'll show you, we said, I bet you there's enough power in this thing that if we put a single stupid transistor that we tape out through our process, one big transistor, that's going to be enough to do all of this. And it actually turned out by luck that it was true. So what we did is took one transistor, connect, I won't go into details, but connected that transistor to the crystal and took the gate of that transistor and exposed it to the fluid and watched if a, uh, you know, a nerve, in this case, fired, would you see it on the outside? And what's amazing about this, and by the way, and another thing, the systems that run the ultrasound head I'm, I'm being very fast and loose. They're super sophisticated, right? Like, th there's a lot of really careful stuff that goes into making these things work, and that's part of the, the fun of it. But what we did is we took this and we put it in a rat and closed up the rat and then talked to this thing from the outside using a single, unsteered, single point focus, cylindrical, like 1975 transducer and just kind of held it there. Um, and what you find, I won't go through, this is how it talks to I'm happy to come back if you really want to know the weeds of how it talks. But what you find is, on the left, this was the neuron paper that kind of broke open all this. So on the top left is a wired recording of uh, a, a nerve compound action potential in the sciatic nerve of the rat sort of firing. And you see, that, you, see that you see this firing, and the percentages are just different curves for how hard we were firing it near its leg. We were firing the neuron just to watch that signal go through. This is with a wire sampled at 200 kilohertz for ground truth. This is like the gold standard you would do. It's overkill, actually. You don't need to do anywhere near 200 kilohertz, but it's a sort of a gold standard recording. And that is what the encoding off the ultrasound gave us. And if you look, it's literally just dead on. It's just, it's just perfect. And you can get you know, all sorts of technical recruitment curves and things like this. And it, 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 the point is, would, it, would you build a medical neural recorder this way? No, you'd build a chip that does you know, also. But it's amazing how much power and how much modulation you get. You could just literally do it with a single FET. And that was kind of the point of this, to show that how much room there was for people to build stuff. OK, so since then, uh, a lot of stuff has happened. Uh, we've since worked with Ricky Muller, like I mentioned, and we built a stimulator. So this is a little thing sitting on a nerve in a rat where what we do now is harvest the energy and use it to stimulate uh, the nerve, okay? And that works marvelously too. In fact, uh, you can do all sorts of cool little programming. You can talk to it, tell it how long to stimulate, hear back that it tells you that it's working, you know, all sorts of standard things you'd, you'd expect out of a medical device. I, I won't go through this because I know it's tedious, but you can stimulate at all sorts of levels, get exactly the, the, you know, the results you want. For those of you in the field, like I said, I, I mean this honestly, just wait and I'm happy at the end to kind of walk you through any, any technical details. What's also cool is what we use this for is to show that how, um, because of acoustics, how forgiving this system is, even without any smart beam steering. So you can, you can take this and it'll tolerate two and a half millimeters of translation and 25 degrees rotation of axis and still operate happily because there's just so much power sitting there that the thing doesn't care. It kind of goes like this and still gets enough power off the aperture to, to do it. Um, in these experiments, uh, we went down five centimeters. Uh, I can tell you sort of, uh, prior to publication, of course, it's not yet published, but it will be. You can go down 15 centimeters with these things pretty much anywhere you want in the body. The only thing that's a problem is bone. Bone is a huge reflector, and so you have to think carefully about how you do it. Which brings me to this. So I know I'm going fast, but I wanted to show you two last things just for fun. The first is that after all this is done, I mean, this is several years of work now. There's a company. The company is building medical devices through contract manufacturing. It's all geared to be you know, very, very well done. I was left with the issue of like, well, what is left for me to do? I mean, it's like, kind of like, I, it's kind of obvious now how you put one foot in front of the other and build these things. And that's happening. And you know, I'm involved in it. But what are, what are the, I like hard, crazy problems. And so the, the last, not the last, that's not true. The, the next problem that seemed really tantalizing is, could I do all of this through a closed skull? So can you shove these things into a skull, which was the, kind of the original problem I pitched you, and could we back out and disentangle all of the signals coming out of these things through a skull without having to have a hole there? And the reason this is hard is that the skull in, a, you know, in us is pretty thick, and it's a scatterer. So basically, it'll, you just shoot sound through it or pretty much anything else, it'll just fuzz it all out. It's like the, 
you know, the, the shower uh, door glass, right? It's intended to just scatter everything so you can't see the other side. And this has turned out to be a really, really fun problem, and it turns out you can do it. And so um, what I would think are sort of four fundamental challenges that, that were outstanding, you know, if you want to use this in the brain, is, uh, and you've hit some of them in your questions. First of all, can I get this super small, much smaller than a millimeter, so down 100 microns? Can I talk to a lot of them? Can I talk to a primate skull? And can I go really deep? Because the cool part about this, the last one is actually subtle, but it turns out I think will be more important than all the other ones. What's cool about this is I can go all the way down to your basal ganglia with this, and it's very hard to do that with anything else. I can get down to your hippocampus, your basal ganglia, and just beam power and get data back from it. And so the demonstration that, that this is possible is, kind of, is really what's been work, what I just presented at a keynote, and the, the paper is you know, essentially moving through the machinery. Um, and the results are actually really cool. So I want to show you this because it's, it's kind of cool. So um, let me skip this whole thing about how you can make super small moats. I, I, I can do that later. I just want to show you this other thing because it's actually kind of cool. So the idea is how could we talk to, if I put lots of these in the, in the, in the brain somewhere, and outside I could put any interrogator I wanted. So however many listening devices and transmission devices I want to put, how would you try to talk to all of these things and get their signal? So, one answer is what someone already kind of uh, alluded to, which is the technical term is beamforming, which is I would use all of these uh, uh, elements to actually aim what I, you know, I would kind of aim there and sit there and, you know, kind of talk to them by beamforming. But another idea, which it turns out is, it is both more powerful and more interesting, is that I would use all of my emitters to launch a plane wave. That plane wave is going to hit all of these. This is the signal that would be measured up here. So, so nothing's measured yet. But you see, I hit them and they reflect back. And they all mess with each other. But then on the receiver side, I start getting something. You see, I start getting something. And the idea is, is there a way that I could, from all of the receive information, back out what all the blue things were telling me? I don't really care where they are, interestingly enough. Sometimes people say, well, how would you figure it out? I don't actually care where they are. I just want to know what they're saying. Because then I can figure out all this data. And it turns out that this works. So I, I don't want to go through this. This is many slides of where I kind of walk technically to what makes it difficult. But I can show you maybe one teaser and then, and then kind of the thing. But what makes this difficult is that these things are, can be kind of tilted. It can be willy-nilly, different depths. I'm not assuming anything. They can each be sending back different amounts of signal. Um, they can mess with each other. And on top of that, Whatever sending the signal has its own noise set into it. I'm not going to go into this because this gets really, really technical. But there's its own noise that it, it hits them with. And when they reflect, that noise travels through the whole, the whole pipe. And so this was kind of the problem statement. And, and I just want to show you this because it's true for everything I've talked to so far. Here's an example of what it actually looks like. So when th this is, let's say this is the nerve signal I was trying to uh, record. So this is just a nerve signal. Here is what the acoustic system hears. So what it does is it sends, right, it sends a pulse, and then it waits a little while, and it waits for the reflected pulse. So this part right here is the bit of stuff that reflected back, and it's coming back. And you can see, notice how it wiggles when, when this thing hits. You see it just, it just changed? The, the, the goal of this little uh, endeavor is to back out from this change if there are many of these things superimposed, back them all out and figure out you know, what they're all saying. And the cool part is, I'm, I'm, you know, here's an example of two of them. So I, I, I will show you. So here's two different ones. They're going to get two different signals at two different times. But you can see every time the little orange ball hits one of them, some part of this changes. In this case, they're different from each other. So this is from implant one, and this is from implant two. This is the easy case. I'll show you the hard one later. But you want to figure out some method, even if they're kind of walked, in, walked into each other or kind of talking over each other. You want to figure out some method to figure this out. So let me skip all this. I, I don't. So what you do is you, I, there's a lot in here, and, and I, I will beg your uh, indulgence. If I, I'm not going to go through it, because I want to prompt for questions. But what you do is you collect all of them, and you back out their, the little uh, signals that are occurring at each part of the, of the trace over time. And you build an enormous library. So let me skip to, um, let me just skip to an example of, 
Um, this is all the linear algebra. I don't want to do any of this. But you, you whoop. So basically what you do is at each of, you have to have lots of receivers, like, like 64 different receivers. And at each one, you collect all of this information. These are all the different signals that are coming. And what you do is you train an algorithm to learn what parts are consistently changing uh, in, in different parts of this and back out essentially what are uh, principal components, although they're not quite that. It's sort of a, a learning library. And then after that, you can essentially uh, decode everything within constraints, but it's pretty forgiving. And what's really cool is um, if they change with time, so like if a little moat changes a little bit, as long as my learner is constantly working this machine learning program, it'll just continue to adjust the library and realize that something's drifting. And it works really, really well. And so this is just in oil. Now, you know, I'll skip this. Then we went and did it in a piece of skull. So this is a, this is a 40 receive channels with one moat through a piece of skull. And here's the ultrasound transducer. And we found that, in fact, you can, you can you know, see it just fine through the skull because you learn these processes even if they're scattered. This is 40 channels inside a full macaque skull and you're learning them all and you'll see in a minute, you'll start seeing them every time they fire, you'll start picking out what every receiver realizes is the signal that comes from this mode and after that you can just decode the spikes. It's doing that in the very last trace. So it, here it's, it's guessing what the spikes are. And then lastly, let's see if I have this. Did, I, did my student allow me to? Oh no, he didn't let me put it. But lastly, you can repeat this with lots of moats and lots of receivers through a skull and back them all out. And so th this is where we are right now, where we really were just tackling what was a really hard math and engineering problem. To give you an appreciation of, of the hardness, because I know I didn't, like this is why I promised at the beginning, I didn't tell you enough to, to, to tell whether I'm you know, just waving my hands in the air. Um, for those of you that like building electronics, the, the devil is not only on the algorithm, but the system you have to build with regards to the amount of noise and the amount of distortion is extremely, extremely uh, aggressive. You have to build a really, really high-end system. And then um, you spend a lot of time, uh, you, you spend a lot of time tweaking how many receive and how many transmit channels you have and lots of other sort of little details. Okay, so let me pause here. I wanna show you one other thing and then be done. I know that was sort of crazy and I apologize, but I really wanted to show you the skull thing because it's kind of, it's actually what's going on right now. The other stuff is kind of old. It's a few years old, yeah. Can you just wait and repeat the question so everyone can hear it? Uh, clearly you can stimulate the neurons and stimulate muscles. Yes, we can stimulate to, muscles to, really to easily. create uh, strength when something's atrophying, in the, for instance, in a cast or something like that? Yeah, so, okay, uh, I didn't show you this data because I ran through it really quickly. It might have been on slide or not, but absolutely you can stimulate a muscle, okay? So the, the more complicated question is, in what context is that useful for rehabilitation, which right. is your question. And the answer is that, um, yeah, there are probably contexts where putting these little uh, moats in and then addressing them from the outside, for sure it is true that muscle stimulation during rehabilitation is effective. I mean, you have to do it right, and there's a lot of research on that, particularly with stroke rehab. Um, and we think the technology could be useful for that. Yes, that's a short version. The second question is, uh, can the extrapolation of this change somebody's thinking? No, no, this is all just, there's no, we're not putting any information back into the system with all the stuff I showed you, right? The goal here is just to try to hear many, many different uh, emitters deep in and through a skull, right? That was kind of the title. That we're not, none of this is stimul, none of that last part is stimulation. Okay, another question. Right, 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 this is what I'm saying. It's very sober, you know, it's all just, no, nothing wonky here. Yeah. Uh, in order to get uh, lots of useful information or do something useful with it, is there a, a, a kind of a careful placement of these things that has to yeah. be done? And on top of, and then once you put them in, I guess you can never take them out, right? So they're there forever. Yeah, two different questions. One is you have to place them carefully, and two is how do you explant them? So you're talking about the implants, right? Yeah, so I mean, the answer is I don't have a, I don't have a good answer for the first one. Um, insofar as beyond a certain amount of common sense, we just don't know yet. So if the thing is completely off axis, it probably is gonna do nothing. 
and then it's going to have some tolerance. I have, nobody in my group has properly mapped that out for this last problem. For the larger case of the one millimeter implant in the periphery, in fact, that is very, very well mapped out. Um, and we know exactly how to, how far you can go and, and what the tricks you have to play to keep it, you know, in communication while you're recording or simulating. The reason for that is that that application is, is so commercially important that it's now you know, been pro passed to a company that has very professional sort of activity going on where it's all for FDA approval and so on. And so that part of it, the one millimeter object, that part of it is way, way far. This stuff I'm showing you is literally the bleeding edge of what crazy grad students are doing in you know, the last nine months. So we don't have any clue. That's the answer. I don't have a freaking idea. How you explant it, again, to be careful, because I don't want to say something you know, that then someone remembers uh, and says, hey, you said this. Uh, for the actual serious applications like a peripheral neuromodulation, there is absolutely an explant technique. The idea being that you, know, you build it so that you can come back if you need to in some case and remove that object and it's, it's, it has to purposefully think, you, know, you have to be able to think about that and express it and prove it. For these things about putting it into cortex, who, who the hell knows? I mean, the, the, the point here is just to figure out what's possible and uh, I would, we would certainly not be removing it uh, in an animal model, right? We would just be doing research with it. <laughs> So, good questions, but. Hey, what, what, there's a lot of blood flow in the brain, and it moves the brain around, and yeah. uh, I'm wondering what, how much you're able to correct for or measure vascular variables. Yeah. And so, let me answer that. I, Hold on. So, first thing is, unrelated to our work, as an aside, but a really cool aside, you can use uh, focused ultrasound with tricks that are related to Doppler, but actually are much more interesting, to back out the um, velocity profiles of red blood cells in your vasculature, and then do essentially a low resolution functional imaging of what the neurons are doing in the same way they try to do bold with MRI. So, right, because you try to figure, infer from the velocity of the red blood cells how hard that particular capillary is trying to do something, and from that you infer something about activity. That's a, a very, really exciting field that came out of France, and it's been going for four years. Now, your question is not that, it's how are you gonna deal with this, all this cute stuff when your brain's like doing something? And the answer is those motions are slow enough relative to the, call it two megahertz or five megahertz signal, right? That's right, five million times per second versus you know, much, much slower, 20 times a second, five times a second, that you can essentially filter that as long as you can either track or you have receivers in enough places. Any of that sort of deformation of this matrix will be a systemic deformation that's very slow, and so you don't care. You can, you can track it. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. I, I'm curious about the white blood cells, though. I have no idea. They're important. I don't know. I, I, they I, are important in the brain's important, yeah. response. The RBC thing is just something that I know because I follow the field, not because I had anything to do with it. Oh. We had one more question yeah, over you, here, you, and then the <laughs> just following the order. <laughs> Uh, two good questions. So one, um, can you get, are you just getting LFP or can you get single units from the, say, when you're doing it uh, within the brain? So when, when we're doing this exact experiment, we're actually not worried any, very much about the front end because all we want to tell is whether the communication system itself will support it. If everything that's being built right now to support this is, is targeting uh, spike. So we're, it, the bandwidth and noise floor of the ASICs that will be connected to this to do it, are all intended to do um, spiking activity. Um, and, and so, then, yeah. Okay. No, I was just saying, so you have to have, you know, the usual, it sounds like you probably do a little work in there, so you have to have the usual, you know, maybe five kilohertz worst case bandwidth and, you know, five microvolts RMS, you know, noise floor and da 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 da. So that, that we're, we're absolutely building for that. And then the other question is, um, can you also just encode an ID in each individual moat so that Yes. You can just infer where it is by knowing by ID where you placed it? You, no, but that's not the problem. So can you put an ID in each individual mode so that you can infer who's who? That's not the problem. The problem is how do I, he, how do I know what ID they're sending me? The problem is exactly this, right? All of you shout at me your name, right? Yeah, you all have names, but if you all shout at me your name, I, I can't do very much with it. But it turns out if I have 40 ears that are sampling really, really fast, I can back out what the heck everybody was saying. That's kind of the quick, dirty analogy for this. I think you had a question. Are the metal implants iron or some other element? Ah, the, the implants, uh, the academic implants, uh, they are not iron, but I'll, t I'll give you an exact answer for, for all of the variants. 
the things that we actually published academically, oh, let me go back, are, um, come on, here, let's use this one to not go that far back. There. This is a polymer circuit board made out of polyimide. And it has a uh, uh, PZT, it's called PZT lead zirconium titanate crystal. And it has a silicon chip that's made out of a standard silicon. Now, and then the whole thing is coated in perylene, um, which is a, a kind of a thin film coating that is hydro, you know, hydrophobic. It's used in medical implants. And often uh, over the top of this, we would put a little glob of medical grade epoxy. Okay, having said that, you would never do that in a human being. That's just because this is an experiment. What you do in a human being is you, all of this is built into a titanium can, a very small, you know, super tiny titanium can for the reasons that, you know, we all know titanium is, is, is a very uh, uh, stable material that you build implants with all the time. Um, so another question, do you have examples of uh, what's possible with this technology and how you envision, you know, applications of it? I'll, I'll tell you, uh, yeah, at the end, let me, I'll do my sort of waxing fanciful sort of visionary thing at the end, yeah. I just want to make sure that like, uh, you know, like I get to show you this stuff. Okay, we're good. I want to show you one unrelated crazy thing. Oh, go ahead, yeah, yeah. I think you're going to answer this. I want, I'd like to hear the end use of this. Yeah, what's, yeah. what's it for? I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you. Okay. But can I show you one thing with, for fun first? Is that okay? All right. You will let I will anyway, yeah. But I gotta pretend I asked for permission because it's, you know. <laughs> no, I'm gonna give you a very, very specific example and I'll spend some time talking about it. I wanna show you this because it's crazy and, and it's really super bleeding edge. It was just published uh, uh, in Nature Communications a month ago and it's, it's just, it's another ultrasound thing and it's so wacky that, so it turns out that um, I'll leave it here for a minute, then I'll show you all the pictures, and I'll make this very fast. This is really for fun, kind of the dessert of the dinner. Um, it turns out that uh, when you send ultrasound through anything, and actually any sound wave, but ultrasound, if you send it through a medium, certain parts of that medium, as you can imagine, are compressed mechanically, and some are rarefied or expanded. Okay, that's obvious. The next thing that somebody realized long ago is that when you do that, you slightly change the index of refraction of the area of that part of the thing in a pressure dependent way. So the index of refraction of the compressed area is going to be different from the index of refraction of the expanded area. And so I had this uh, postdoc who was watching all this neural dust stuff and he said, you know, what happens if I pattern the ultrasound into a waveguide? Um, can I then just pipe light and, and then if I move the waveguide around, can I just kind of like do crazy things? And it turns out that amazingly, this is totally bizarre, this works really well. So I don't know what the hell we're going to use it for yet. I just thought, thought it, we published it and I think people are excited and he's off at CMU making a career out of it. But what's cool is, you know, if I make a pressure uh, shape with ultrasound such that I have a core that has one pressure and then a, uh, if you think about it like a cladding, like a fiber optic cable, that's something different and then you send light through it, um, you in fact can pipe light through brain tissue where if I change the ultrasound pattern, the light moves and I have no lenses, I have nothing. I'm literally using the brain itself as a, as a waveguide. And so let me see if I find one cute little movie. So th th that light is being moved around with nothing. It's basically all you're doing here is changing the ultrasound you're sending in and the light then gets moved around inside the inside um, tissue, and it's kind of crazy because you know you ask what would you what what's the future? That's the you know once you realize you can do this, then you start thinking like can I make a grading? Can I make a lens? Like how sophisticated a pattern can I make? Could I build a whole weird like beam splitter inside brain tissue? Uh, you know just just with this kind of stuff. So I thought I'd show you that it's a very weird use of ultrasound that would never have occurred to me. And now I will answer your question. Uh, and and I'll, I'll show you, you know, why this company was started. Actually, let me not, let me not uh, sell the company because it's a little cheesy. Let me just tell you the answer to your thing. Uh, for the last, uh, all right, so let me back up. So historically, when uh, you look at neuromodulation devices, so those are things that use electricity somehow to affect something in your body, you have pacemakers, you have deep brain stimulators, you have a variety of other things, for example, bladder stimulators for overactive bladder and so on. And those have historically been uh, kind of signature devices in that they require decades of development. They're very stable. They're all very large. 
um, because they rely on batteries and cans and some sort of charging coil and a long lead that has the electrodes in it. Um, over the last 15 years and really, really over the last decade, there's been a, uh, for many reasons I can get into, but there's been this realization that um, there are many nerve targets in the periphery that if we could properly record or stimulate from them, we could affect the course of a lot of diseases. And I'm going to give you a specific example and then give you others. And these targets, this is an area that is very, very hot right now, and so the jury's still out on a lot of different plays, but uh, it's an area that could have a very profound impact. It's, the moniker is bioelectronic medicine, and you can kind of find examples of this. So let me give you one profound example for which the pioneer in this is a company called Setpoint Medical, um, and they come out of an institute called the Feinstein Institute in Long Island. And the head of that is a guy named Kevin Tracy, who is really the visionary that figured this out. So Kevin Tracy uh, built his career in inflammation, inflammatory disease, on the, not the simulator side. And what he found, and it, it really took him a while, and then it just cracked open, and it was just, an, it's a completely new field, and has been for some years, is that your peripheral nervous system modulates your inflammatory response in a very direct way. So the canonical medical school thing of 30 years ago or 20 years ago was you have an inflammatory response, you know, you have cytokines, like if you have RA or you have something related, uh, you're going to have these vicious cycles that have to do with inflammatory chemicals. And then you have your nervous system, which, you know, does all the things you think your peripheral nervous system does. But it turns out that your peripheral nervous system both modulates the activity of the inflammatory response. That is to say, for example, it controls the spleen in a very specific ways that are wor being worked out. And that information also travels upstream to your brain, and your brain is aware of it. It is not something that's just sort of happening. So the notion that we could build stimulators and recorders that are so small that we could lower the but the, the barrier to implantation to allow for these therapies is a profound idea and it's one that's driving a lot of investment because today if one were to get something to try to affect a nerve you have to accept that someone's going to shove a can this big or that big or whatever you know Exonix just IPO'd in November and it has a you know it's like a USB stick it's like a really fat USB stick and that's the system and you can imagine right I mean there's a, there's a fairly high bar you're going to allow that to be put into your body we believe strongly that, and a lot of people in our field, it's not, you know, I, I'm one of them, but that if we can lower that barrier because the things that you now implant are very small, they can be delivered laparoscopically, the, um, the risk profile for both the, the intervention to deliver it and the long-term, you know, effect of having it in there is small, you're not going to get a fibroid capsule. Whenever you put these things in there, you get a fibroid capsule around them. Um, you can get infection from the wires, a very known adverse effect uh, profile. We believe very strongly that that would change a lot of medicine. And the medical companies, uh, the, the pharmaceutical companies, uh, uh, have now been exploring this space. GlaxoSmithKline was the biggest headliner. They made a lot of noise getting into this uh, space and started Galvani with Verily. So Verily and GlaxoSmithKline have a joint venture uh, called Galvani that's pretty well funded. But there's a lot of these people now. Everyone's trying to come in and understand, huh, that's interesting. What else can you do? Can you affect this nerve? Can you affect that nerve? But your, your ability to, to ad administer therapy uh, in these conditions is very hampered if all you have to work with is, you know, if I have to stick this inside you. So that's one, that's one uh, class. The next class is that I don't have to use this as a therapeutic. I can put all sorts of sensors on this thing and now use it as a diagnostic. From a regulatory perspective, that's a much more complicated path because if you build a diagnostic, what you have to demonstrate is not that when I push a button, it does this thing as you would with a therapeutic. In a diagnostic, what you have to show is I put this thing in, some information came out, and, a and you affect the flow, the, the clinical flow beyond that. You have to show that it has a benefit to the, to the, to the patient, right? The clinician can do something with that, and you have to show she did something with that and that someone got better, right, in some fashion. And so, the diagnostic play, to your point about what's the vision, the diagnostic play in the periphery is profound, but it's going to be a while as people kind of creep their way in. I mean, if I were to put on my hat of spinning fun things, I mean, the idea that you could Fitbit your liver, that you could essentially put a millimeter cubic thing and mo monitor the oxygen. Think about it. What if I could monitor the oxygen concentration in the portal vein of your liver every day of your life and you were uh, at risk of fatty liver disease? 
I can tell if you're getting that by watching your PV, right? No one's going to put something this big to do that. And so now the problem with that, though, is it's a regulatory, it's a decadal regulatory journey to show that that has an the, 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 the impact is profound. I think the impact of having cubic millimeter implants possible very deep in the body for very hard to reach targets is absolutely profound. And then you can go into La La Land and say, what could I do in the brain? And I can record. But, but really, let's be sober. I mean, that is an academic endeavor today. So am I excited by it? Yes. Does it you know, feed my grad students? Yes. Are, are, do I think there's something in the long term there? Absolutely. But the, hit, the first impact isn't going to be you know, putting these things in, the, in your skull. It's going to be all the things you could do down here for real diseases. And, and that's really, I think, where we're headed for this. OK, with that, so did that, did that meet the, your, your, so I soapboxed enough at the end? OK, so with that, I will, uh, before you clap, so <laughs> these are all of the, you know, this is the NASCAR uh, uh, slide with all of the funders. But, but, you know, what I love about this slide is that you can, if you look at where my son and my daughter are, she loves all the postdocs and grad students and is super into it. And my son is holding a Frisbee waiting for it all to be over, which I just said He's like, who gives a shit about this? I want to go throw a Frisbee. All right, thank you. I, I really appreciate it. Thank you, Michelle. <laughs> Thanks. I think uh, we have time for one or, more qu one or two more questions. Um, I have nowhere to go so, until I'm okay. done. And I'll go home. <laughs> So actually, a uh, follow-on. So you were saying how the inf uh, peripheral uh, nervous system can affect inflammation. So like right now, when there's all this inflammation, you know, the pharmaceutical companies have all these um, anti-TNF and other remicade, those kinds of things. So would it be conceivable that you could actually use the peripheral system with these implants to actually inf change your inflammation response? And I guess the second part of that is... The answer is yes. Okay, and the second part is you could actually then implant sensors to see how the inflammation is changing based on this. Yes. So without going into any of the chemicals or disturbing anything, you could in effect do all of that. Oh, that's pretty amazing. And, and is that already implemented or that, that's like for the future you're talking about? Yes. <laughs> yeah, it, it, there's, it, it's absolutely happened. Um, maybe one more question? Or everyone's ready to go. That's shameless, so you know. <laughs> I just thought it'd be funny to show you that as I answered your question. But we'll go back well, to the academic slide. Well, then thank you again, Thanks Michelle. For thank you so much. We have a, a present for you oh, with cool. the signature Hana House mark. I love it. Thank you so much for thank coming. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Um, and also, please give a round of applause to our fantastic operations manager, Anna, who took over the, the AV tonight. <laughs> Um, yeah, we will put up um, the Eventbrite page for the next um, event in the next couple of days. So just uh, check that out if you want to attend next month's event. And then we look forward to welcoming you again. Have a nice evening. Thank you.